What are some of the habits that can destroy your retirement? There's, there's some everyday behaviors that I think we all as, as humans sort of undermine our ability to save money and to have a view towards the future, particularly when you consider that 39% of Americans have nothing saved for the future. That's a pretty disturbing statistic when you stop and, and think about it. And so there must be a lot of everyday human habits out there that prevent people from being able to save money that sort of cause them to go astray. So we thought we'd spend some time talking about that and, and more specifically how to avoid that here on the program. So welcome back to Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. We're Central Florida's longest running radio program coming to you here on Sunday mornings on the News Radio WFLA Orlando Network, along with 96.9 The Game. Also happen to be one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary with Nelson Financial Planning, where our team of certified financial fiduciary stands ready this very week to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective retirement plan that produces superior investment results and provides you with peace of mind for the future. So what are those common habits that are pretty synonymous to humans that ultimately send your retirement in the wrong direction. Well, we've got a bunch for you to sort of consider, courtesy of an article from bankrate.com that we wanted to kind of share some of those highlights with you. Some of you, them you probably know, so others you might not quite be aware of or maybe not appreciate or hopefully not you're in the middle of doing. So here we go. Number one, of course, it's got to be number one, right? One of the habits, worst habits you can have that undermines your ability to have a successful retirement is if you are spending now rather than saving for later. That one's pretty obvious, of course. Uh, easier to focus on the present, right, than the future. And the reality is that we have a very need it now, easy access culture that really sort of helps to sort of fuel the fire on that. Uh, there's the B word that everybody likes to avoid, but uh, the B word budget is a good idea to have, whether uh, that's just to become more disciplined or in fact to keep track of how much money's coming in and how many how much uh, expenses are going out so the notion of looking at income versus expensive that is the classic way of figuring out a budget a bunch of great ways to be able to do that in today's world there's apps that you can use on your phone you can download your statements look at your statements all the time online great ways to be able to do it no excuses for not being able to do a budget in today's world with technology the way that it is you certainly want to start now that's how you manage to take advantage of the power of compound interest and those kinds of things that really help to accelerate that return. So that one's, yeah, pretty pretty obvious. Uh, the other one might not be quite so obvious, and that would be underestimating how much you'll actually need for retirement. You need to not just be concerned about today's budget, but what that future budget may look like. And oftentimes what we see is that folks when they retire, there's, there's sort of three different areas where they can get a little fuzzy or a little off in terms of the projections and what they're, what the numbers are that they're looking at. And it breaks down into three different categories that you don't necessarily think of. The first and foremost is, of course, taxes, right? When you're working, your employer kind of takes that out of your paycheck and you don't really see it, and that's great. When you're retired, however, you've got to take it out of your income that you're getting on a regular basis, and that effectively means that, hey, if I'm getting a $1,500 pension, the reality is it's not going to be $1,500 if I'm holding 10% for taxes. That's going to be more like $1,350. That's a difference. The taxes now are much more your responsibility when you retire. The second thing is health insurance. And this one obviously is a huge issue. A lot of folks don't really appreciate how much health insurance is going to be when you retire, particularly if you're not age 65 and eligible for Medicare, it can be a really big number. And the reality is most people don't necessarily see how big that number is. Because again, if you're working for an employer, they're providing benefits perhaps under a group plan, or maybe they're covering a significant portion of the cost. Now, in retirement, you've got to cover 
all of that cost. And then lastly is the category that we like to refer to as free time expense. That's this notion that if you're getting up every day and going to the office and then coming home, that means that that day is consumed at the office. Well, if you're at the office, chances are you're not goofing around and spending money. Well, maybe you are online or something, but should be because you're at work. So the reality is that that notion of no longer being at work gives you much more free time. What, what, what do the people typically do with their free time? Well, oftentimes it involves spending money, whether it's golfing, traveling, or following their hobbies, all of that takes money. So that you wanna add into sort of that, that look for retirement, this notion of that, that free time uh, expense. Uh, another popular habit I think that people do that sort of undermines their return is that they only invest in the best performing funds or perhaps they just choose the default target date option. I'm not going to get too deep into the target date conversation on this program. We talked about that last week or maybe it was a couple weeks ago. If you want to find out more about that, just check us out on our YouTube channel at Nelson Financial Planning or go to uh, our Facebook or Twitter or any of those types of social media platforms and you'll be able to see the library of shows that we've done in the past. So I'm not going to talk a lot about target date funds. Bottom line, don't have a particularly warm and fuzzy view of them. We're think, we think that they're just simply too cookie cutter for what they're providing. But the notion of, of looking for only investing in best performing funds sort of underscores this notion of, of chasing returns, right? We look at something and say, wow, that did really great, and now I'm going to put my money into it. The reality is that you're probably late to the game on that. And you can see that there's been a lot of analysis done on like uh, Morningstar five-star rated funds. The funds that today are five-star rated funds oftentimes will not have that same excellent track record in the future. Why is that? That's because a lot of the Morningstar star system, if you will, really looks at short-term performance. And I think that's an issue with humans in, in general is we all look at that short-term performance number and we say, oh wow, that looks really great. That did great over the past year. That did great over the past three years. But the reality is that something may have been happening that might really skew the results. So if you're constantly chasing that best performance over that course of that one or three year period of time, then you're gonna wind up underperforming going forward. So the way you kind of avoid that is you look at funds that have been around a long time, that have that 10 year, we often say it's gotta be at least a 15 year track record in today's world because 15 years will get you back into the 2008, 2009 timeframe. If you're just looking at 10 years, that's pretty much all after 2008, 2009. So that winds up being a lot of up in the market. So that number can be a little misleading in terms of the performance that that kind of fund can in fact deliver through all types of market cycles. So, be careful about chasing or only investing in the best performing funds. You want to really kind of take a look at more the longer term record of a fund rather than kind of get too hung up on sort of that most recent best performance. Uh, similarly, on the list of, of habits that can sort of undermine your retirement is sort of misunderstanding what diversification is. Diversification uh, is not just, hey, I own 10 funds. It's important to go sort of behind the curtain and really look at the mix between stocks versus bonds and to sort of get that overall view of where you're at in terms of the balance between stocks versus bonds, but also to drill down that further, right? Know how much you've got in large companies, how much in small companies, how much in domestic, how much in international. And if you want to go even deeper, which we would encourage you to do, really look at sort of the top 10 holdings that are in that portfolio as a whole, because what you'll find is that a lot of funds have a tendency to own the same types of companies or the same companies in today's world. And so you wanna make sure that, hey, just because I own 10 different funds, if, if the number one holding in every single one of those funds is Microsoft or Amazon or whoever, uh, that winds up really undermining your overall diversification. So we got some more of these types of habits to share with you uh, on the program. We'll continue this uh, through the break here at the bottom of the hour and uh, continue on some of these habits that can undermine your retirement. So stay tuned with us through the break here on Dollars and Cents 
This is Joel Garrison, Nelson Financial Planning, News Radio, WFLA, Orlando.